I love that video of Aubrey and Daniel. And let me just tell you, she is one of the OG kids church kids here at Canoe Creek. Yes, we put them in the closet, but it wasn't all day. It was fine. Um, they just were totally good with it. That video just blesses my heart because it embodies the ministry and vision of the family ministry here at Canoe Creek because we want to partner with families because we want to equip the next generation to seek, serve, and share Jesus with their world. Um, we want to link arms with all families to help them do that. Together, we know that we have about 936 weeks from a time the child is born to the time they graduate high school and move on to what's next. In those years, we want to help lay the faith foundation for their children to build upon for the rest of their lives. Now, as Doug was saying, uh, we have been focusing on different generations for the past couple of weeks, but we honor and value all generations. Um, do you know your generation? Um, you will make me feel very welcome if you will help talk back to me. Um, if on the screen behind me, you'll see a chart. If you don't know the name of your generation, um, you can look beneath and see the year. So are there anybody in here that are part of the builder generation? We, we had um, Mrs. Hastings, who was part of the builder generation in the first service. Okay, where are my baby boomers? Okay, excellent. Yes, I can tell some of you experienced the 60s. Fabulous. Okay, so where are my Gen Xers? Gen X, still rocking the plaid. Right on. Okay, so where are my Gen Y? Very good. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to say Gen Y. Because when you say millennials, people get a little iffy. And so let me just tell you this. We're not going to do that anymore because the millennials that I know, like the ones who just went, woo, they love God. They serve their community and they're making amazing things happen in our community. So we're going to just say Gen Y and we're not going to say the M word anymore. Okay. So thank you. Okay. So what about Gen Z? How many of our middle school, high school, young adults? Okay. See you guys uh, representing. Now you were a little like, you didn't know if you wanted to commit or not, just in case something better was going to happen. But yes, you raised your hand. Good job. The only, do we have any alphas in here? Any alpha generation? There's a few of us represented in here. If you don't have any kids or grandkids, you might not be familiar with what Gen Alpha is doing. That whole side of the building is dedicated to Gen Alpha. But I do have some representatives I would love to introduce you to. This is Malia. Malia is two years old and she is learning how to pray on her own. She randomly clasps her hands and closes her eyes really tight and says, Jesus loves me, this I know, Bible tells me so, amen. Sweetest thing, that's authentic prayer for her. Now, this is Leighton. Leighton is learning how to hide God's word in his heart by memorizing scripture. Take a look. What's it say? I am fearfully, wonderfully made. From, from 139, 14. Good oh, don't you just love that? Okay, and then here's a picture of some more preschoolers. They are learning that they can love like Jesus. Now, these big boys are not preschoolers. They were not retained. Um, Hayden is a small group co-leader with his mom and his sister. And Dusty is a one-on-one -on -one buddy with his little special guy, Parker. Let me tell you, those preschoolers look up to the big boys and they love having them in there. Here's another picture of Bentley. Bentley has autism. And because he has a one-on-one -on -one buddy here at church, he gets to hear a Bible story every week and he's starting to feel comfortable making strides in his class. And there's an extra bonus to that because our one-on-one -on -one buddies are so amazing and they show up for Bentley. Bentley's mom gets to go to church it doesn't have to worry about her son. Isn't that amazing? So 
This is a picture of Sophia and Samantha. Oh my goodness, these girls are in, um, last year during the beginning of our all in, all in initiative, they wanted to help build excitement with our elementary school kids, so they designed these two coloring pages. And um, so we got to color them and, and start to understand what it means to be all in here at Canoe Creek. Here's another picture of Amelia. She has the dark shirt on right here. She loves to help lead worship. Now, if you've never experienced elementary worship, you're missing out because it is a full body experience. We have hand motions and music and lights, and it is all so good. So don't you think that Gen Alpha is off to a really good start? I think so too. These kids are being taught from an early age how much God loves them, but they're being taught how to love God right back. We are so prayerful and hopeful that out of this generation comes the next church leaders, the next worship minister, the children's minister, student minister, preacher, elder, or could they be just a person who loves the Lord so much that they can help bring us all together in the church in times of crisis? Can they be the one who models what it looks like to love God and love Jesus and share him with their world? I sure hope so. But it brings me to a hard question. What if, what if little Leighton, who's memorizing scripture, or Malia, who's learning how to pray, or Amelia, who is helping lead worship in childhood, what if they say, that was good when I was a kid, but I don't need to pass that along to anybody else. What if they say, it's not worth teaching my children about God and what he's done for me? That's unsettling. Could you imagine what their homes or their communities might look like? But before you say that's ridiculous and you're quick to dismiss it, it's happened before. If you have a Bible, um, if you brought it with you today, we're going to be looking at a couple of uh, Old Testament passages, but we're going to look at New Testament as well. I'm going to go pretty quick, but they're going to be on the screen behind me. If you, we're going to go to Judges first, so you can be looking at that while I'm talking. If you don't own a Bible, we are so um, in love with God's word here that we want you to have one. Like we give them away every Sunday. If, they're, if you don't own one for yourselves, take the one in the chair in front of you. Write your name in it. That's yours. If you don't know how to study it, I want you to come and get connected in a core class. Because once you learn how to study and read God's word, oh my goodness, it changes your heart. It changes your life forever. So, Judges 2. Verse 10, and this is what it says. After the whole generation had gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Take that in for a minute. That's three generations removed from Moses. Moses, you know, the man that God sent to deliver the Israelites out of bondage and slavery? That guy, they forgot what he said. They had forgotten what God had done for them. And because of that, they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And they lived however they saw fit. Could you imagine what their community looked like? Sharing stories of God's goodness through history and in our lives is key to passing our faith down to the next generation. It's the responsibility that starts at home with the parents but it's not just the parents. It extends to our church family as well. It's a collective commitment to pass our beliefs down to the next generation. At Canoe Creek, we understand that all families come in all different shapes and sizes. And there are people here today that don't even have kids. But stay tuned because this message is for you too. We honor whatever your family dynamic and structure is. Some have been blessed with positive role models, and some have had experienced hurts and disappointment and pain. Regardless of our circumstances, as Christians, we're all part of God's family, and we're responsible for passing our faith down to future generations. Now, some of you might not know this about me, but I am originally from California. 
And I moved to Kentucky when I was in elementary school. So I did elementary school all in Kentucky. And then I went to, I moved here my last week of um, fifth grade. So you can't tell where I'm from from my ass, accent because sometimes it comes out like for sure, y'all. Like you can't really tell that I am um, originally from there, but I'm here the longest. So I consider myself a Floridian. Um, growing up, because we lived in Kentucky, I didn't have a um, any family around me. It was just my mom, my dad, and my brother. And so my grandparents in California called dibs every summer. They're like, we need Carrie. You need to send her to us. And I was so happy because not only did I get my grandparents, I got aunts and uncles and cousins and my sister and my brother. Oh, man, those summers will always be the highlight of my childhood. In the summer of 1984, I stepped off the plane in LAX to find the entire city of Los Angeles buzzing with Olympic fever. That year, the Summer Olympics was being hosted in Los Angeles, and it affected the entire summer. It was on... Uh, had to do with the, the type of cereal boxes that we would pick because we wanted the one with the cool athlete on it. It was on um, all the commercials and newspapers and magazines. It affected the way that we played because we could not do a somersault in the yard or um, a cartwheel without sticking the landing like Mary Lou Retton. We could not run and race down the street without thinking that we were just as fast as Carl Lewis. We were not, but we thought that we were just as fast as he was. Now, some of you might not be familiar with Carl Lewis. He has set world records in track and field. He has also won Olympic gold. And one of my favorite races had to do with a relay race that he had in the 84 Olympics. And I have part of that footage here. So let's take a look. Lewis waiting. He'll get the baton about 30 seconds after the start. To a good start in lane five. Sam Granny in five. Ready to hand off now to Ron Brown. Remember, they've had a little bit of trouble. Pretty good exchange pretty right good. there. Not great, but pretty good. All right, Brown is ready now as he heads down to the far turn to give it to Calvin good Smith. Good pass. Good pass right there. Smith is about ready to take the lead. It's going to be up to Carl Lewis. The U.S. well out in front. Here's the final exchange now. Lewis starts. Lewis takes the baton. Lewis is going to win it going away. We'll keep our eye on the clock. Carl is on his way to gold medal number four. Carl Lewis winning it by almost 15 meters. 30. If you were not alive in the 80s, that's what TV looked like. I want us to look today like passing our faith down, like passing a baton in a relay race. Just like Carl Lewis, he was intentional about making sure that when he showed up on the track, he was ready. So as members of God's family, passing the baton of faith to the next generation is our responsibility. Are we ready? I want to share three principles with you. Not promises, not guarantees, because we're talking about raising humans, and they are tricky. And so whenever we are talking about raising our children to love Jesus, there's principles there. But it's good because it gets us on the right track on where we should go. There are things that we can do when our children are young to help them be successful and take that baton. So the first principle is this. Those who lead the way determine the speed for those who come after them. So when we take that baton of our faith and we pass it down to the next generation, we are passing down our values. Each one looks to the generation before how to run the race. And each generation gives that next generation either a head start or a handicap. The parents can't as parents, we cannot pass down what we do not possess ourselves. We can want our kids to love Jesus, but we have to model that for them. Passing the baton of faith begins when we get serious about our own faith. By constantly modeling our faith to our kids, we are making God normal, not formal. So... In Judges 2.10, we read that the whole generation forgot 
God and what he had done for them. Moses was a wise and trusted leader. He gave their great relatives clear instructions on how to live out their faith. Why in the world did they forget it? Was it too hard? Was it too complicated? Were there too many steps? Was it like Ikea furniture instructions? Like what, what was it? Why was it so hard? Moses told them that the most important thing about passing down to every generation was a relationship, a relationship with God. So this is what he said. Turn with me to Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 9, and it says this. This, this is it. Don't miss this part. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength. These commands I give you today to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about it when you sit at home and when you walk, around, walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on your door frames of your houses and on your gates. That doesn't really seem too complicated to me. What Moses wanted is for us to talk about our faith with the next generation organically, yet intentionally. These verses serve as a reminder to us that teaching can, can, can be done anywhere through informal means. It can be at home. It can be at church. It can be at Walmart. It can be in the car rider line. It can be when you see a beautiful rainbow in the sky and you go, look, look what God has done and point them back to Noah. You can talk about a hard time that's happened in your life, but look what God has done. You can't rush this process. I wish you could. I wish it was as easy as checking a box, but you cannot rush it. It's a result of years and years of loving your children and being honest and real about your faith. It's about thousands of bedtime prayers and, and thousands of questions about heaven and God and the Bible. And you know what? I'm going to let you off the hook right now. If you don't know the answers to all of these many questions that our children pepper us with, it's okay. Find out together. I love it when parents say, you know what? I don't know, but let's look at the Bible. Let's see what it says. Passing the baton of faith is about an everyday relationship with God, not an every week religion about God. I'm going to say that one more time. Passing the baton of faith is about an everyday relationship with God, not an every week religion about God. As we love God with all of our hearts, it becomes a part of who we are. And then we are able to transfer that to our children. In 2 Timothy 1.5, Paul wrote to Timothy and he said this, I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And I am persuaded now in you also. Notice the race began with a fierce grandma. She ran that, that first leg of the race. We don't know how she came to um, faith in Jesus, but she did. And she passed that on to the second leg of the race, which is Eunice. And who passed that down? To Timothy. Y'all don't ever underestimate the power of a praying grandma or mama. Okay? We don't know how these women came to faith, but you got to know that they were raised in the Jewish faith first. And for them to risk everything to stand up and accept Jesus as their savior took great courage. And Timothy watched his predecessors do all of that and he took it in. So three generations are building on that. But remember the particular kind of faith a sincere faith, not a religion, not cultural Christianity, not uh, just getting together and say, oh, I'll pray for you, and then never really doing it. A sincere faith, real faith, life-changing, life-saving faith. 
So what kind of pace are we setting for the children that are watching you? Because make no mistake about it, they are watching you. If you profess to be a Christian at work, they are watching you. If you profess to be a Christian in the classroom, they are watching you. So what are they, watch, what are they watching for? I'm reminded of a sweet uh, friend of mine who serves in the children's ministry. Several years ago, she came and said, hey, can I serve in the children's ministry? And I said, absolutely, we'll get you trained and background checked and we'll get you plugged in. And she said, wonderful, can I bring my kids? Yes, of course you can bring your high school kids. We would love that. She said, it's because it's really important that I show them what it's like to serve. I love that. She went on to tell me the reason why it was important. It was important to her because her mom and dad did not go to church, but sent her to church, dropped her off, and then left. <laughs> it was important for them, for her, to go and be there. These were good people. They served their community. They were ethical people, but they did not have Jesus. And so my friend had wonderful Sunday school teachers that took her under their wing and loved her and ministered to her, and she received Jesus. All through elementary school, this continued. And mom and dad still were not believers. All through middle school, all through high school. And something amazing happened in college. Her mom and dad saw her example because they had been watching her. And they said, I want that. That's authentic faith. And they received Jesus. And they went on to um, serve in their local church. And they went on to not only be good, great, ethical people, but people who love Jesus. And the part of the story that's bittersweet is that her, her daddy went home to be with the Lord last year. But we have blessed assurance because he watched her example of what it was like to follow Jesus. So people in our lives are watching us. They're watching us work. They're watching us play. They're watching us talk to people. So what are they looking for? They're looking for authenticity. You know, in a world full of VR and filters, people know what fake looks like. They know a phony a mile away. So what they're looking for is what's real. They're not looking for perfection. They know that we are humans. They know that we will mess up but they're looking to see if you have a sincere faith. So I invite you to test that. The next time you blow it in front of your kids, I want you to be sincere. I want you to look them in the eye and say, I'm sorry. Tell them that you want to follow Jesus, but you mess up sometimes. Do this and watch the demeanor of your child change before your eyes because they see a real faith at work in you. I know this firsthand because it happened to me. My mom and I loved my mom, loved her so much. We did not always like each other, but we loved each other. And something happened like when we became adults or I became an adult, it, sometimes we just butted heads she was diagnosed with lung cancer and she fought that cancer for four years. And in that time, I just felt like she loves Jesus, I love Jesus. You know, those hurts, I gotta let it go. But I just felt like I needed, I needed to tell her that I was sorry and then I needed her to know that there were some hurts that I had too. And so I did, I went to her and, and cancer had robbed her from her hair and of her youthful face, but her crystal blue eyes were still looking at me. And I told her that I was sorry for the stuff that I needed to own. And she looked at me and she said, I forgive you. And will you please forgive me of how I let you down? I was not the mom that you deserved. In that moment, God did not heal her cancer but he healed our hearts. The power of saying, I'm sorry, and I forgive you. That's good stuff right there. Now I want you to know the third principle. Because we see everyone who ran 
Because those who run before set the pace for those who follow, the second one is just as important. A successful handoff requires practice. Now, you, we have to practice this because it's not automatic. But I'll tell you that when our faith becomes their faith, that's when the transition happens. What we need to do is we need to make our children less dependent on us and more dependent on God. That happens this way. When they're little, they depend on us for everything. And we understand that. They, they need us to pour their milk and tie their shoe. But as they get older, they can pour their own milk and tie their own shoe. It's the same with our faith. If they see us praying and they start praying, that baton is being passed. If you see them going to small group, that baton is being passed. When you start to say, hey, would you pray for me about this? And they pray over you, that baton is being passed. When we make God normal, that baton is being passed. We want to transfer their dependence to the one and only person of God that will never let them down, who will be completely faithful to them in every single way. And once our children depend on God, you did it. That's it. The exchange has been made. Now, the third thing is this. Once the handoff has been made, your job is not over yet. You have to stay on the field and keep cheering. Could you imagine if you're watching a relay race in the Olympics and the first runner of the race reaches out their arm and they pass the baton and they watch the runner take off and then they say, okay, job done. They grab their duffel bag and they start going back to the locker room without watching the rest of the race. No way, that's not what happens. What they do is they stay on the field and they use every bit of energy that they have to cheer and get that runner to the finish line so they can win. The handoff is important, but your, your job is not done yet. The race isn't over after the baton is passed because there's still important work to do. I had... Um, this makes me think of my college roommate, Catherine Haskett. She was a mentor to me. Um, she was my roommate. She was 82. I was 20. Um, we were like Thelma and Louise. It was fabulous. But she was there when I needed her most. This is a picture of, of Granny, which some of you in this room lovingly remember her as. She loved Vacation Bible School. She loved serving kids. She knew that if there was a chance to be a part of sharing the gospel with kids, she wanted to be there. Granny was legally blind. She depended on a walker but she still showed up. She loved to be able to play any part that she could to help the kids know more about Jesus. She's 99 in this picture. Isn't that cool? There's another picture I wanted to show you of her. I mean, she never stopped modeling what it looked like to follow Jesus. She knew that her job was not over yet. She's 100 in this picture. So if some of you are thinking, I'm not going to sign up for VBS yet because, you know, I'm a little older, the bar has been set. <laughs> so you have no excuses. You got you to gotta come on. You can set the pace for your children by how you run it, giving them a good head start. You can practice the handoff through childhood and adolescence. But when the exchange is made, your work is not done. You need to keep cheering because you never stop being a parent. You can't, sometimes as we have grown children, sometimes that baton is passed and it's an easy transition and sometimes it's not. Some of us have grown children. Maybe the baton has been dropped, but I want you to know that the race is not over yet. The nice thing about passing down our faith is there's no time zone. There's no time limit. It's an everyday, everyday happening. It can happen quickly over many years, or like I said, into adulthood. Even if the baton is dropped, you can still be there to help them pick it up. 
continue to be there for your children. You're still able to share your faith with them, but don't nag. You're still able to invite them to church and and share with them the things that you've realized about God, how you're still growing, but don't nag. Resist the, the thought of trying to be a Beverly Goldberg. You do not want to smother them, I promise. Because in your good intentions, you might be pushing them away instead of drawing them near. They know how you feel already. I know that there are parents in this room that might be hurting right now. This topic might be so painful because their child has, has never grasped the, the baton or they have dropped it. I encourage you, keep that door open. Don't shut that person out of your life because you're not happy with the choices that they've made or how they are living their everyday life. Don't make faith in God a battleground. Continue to love them, encourage them, enjoy them, include them, and by all means, continue to pray for them. It's not dwelling on things that you could have or should have done when they were little. If you have certain sins in your life that you need to be right with God, get right with God. Take it to them. Take it to God, then take it to your children. You want to make sure that to be able to the power in, I forgive you and will you forgive me is there that we're passing that down to future generations. You could do everything that you could to make that handoff and they still might not take it. I'll tell you this. You have to move beyond your guilt. If you've gotten right with God, you need to move beyond your guilt and you need to be able to say that this race is still not over. Most people that have been raised with an authentic faith to embrace the Lord will one day come back to it. There might be years of of pain and heartache and wondering. That's okay because they will return to it one day. Remember, there are no guarantees when working with kids and serving people around you. But you wanna make sure that you are on the track if they ever want to pick up that baton again. So keep on cheering. At the beginning of our time together, I asked you about Gen Alpha. What if, what if they did not pass their faith down to the next generation? What if they decided that God wasn't worth sharing with their children? That is scary. Again, what would their family look like? What would their communities look like? But let me ask you a couple more questions. What if we show up in the lives of kids and students and we model for them what it looks like to have a sincere faith? When we do that and we show them how loving God and loving people can be normal and they can walk out an everyday walk with God. What if we made the handoff to them and they ran with it, surpassing anything that we've ever done in our generation? Their generation might experience the greatest revival this nation has ever seen. So yes, I do believe that Generation Alpha is off to a great start. And they are depending on all of the generations that have gone before them to show them the way. Let's pray.